Today's discussions at the 15th session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues uh, focus on the theme of conflict, peace and resolution. A panel this afternoon will discuss the particular situation of Indigenous women who are often caught in the crossfire of conflicts and become victims of increased discrimination and violence. The panel will also discuss Indigenous women's strategies to ac access justice, uh, their participation in decision making and peace building and their contributions to sustainable peace, reconciliation, and harmony. Three distinguished speakers uh, are here today to brief us on this topic. The first is Ms. Mariam Wale Abu Bakrin, a medical doctor from Mali. She's a member of Tin Hinan, a women's association working for the defense, promotion, and development of indigenous peoples in Africa, in particular the Tuareg. She's currently one of the vice chairs of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. In the middle is, sorry, at the, in the middle is Ms. Victoria Tauli Corpus, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. She is herself an indigenous leader from the Kanakanei Igorot people in the Philippines. And as an indigenous activist, she has worked for over three decades for advocating for indigenous peoples and for women's rights. In 2015, she launched a report on the situation of indigenous women, which also focuses on the situation of women in times of conflict, the topic of this discussion. And on the far end, we have Ms. Rosalina Tuyuk, a Mayan human rights activist from Guatemala. She's the founder of the National Association of Guatemalan Widows, and she has received the French Legion of Honor as well as Japan's Niwano Peace Prize in recognition of her work for peace and human rights. She has also served as Vice President of Congress and as the Chair of the National Reparations Commission. So I'll give the floor first to Mariam. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Today we will be talking about uh, the main theme of this 15th session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. The focus is conflict, peace and resolution. If this theme is a priority, it's because conflicts have negative impacts on all indigenous peoples, but especially on indigenous women, because indigenous women are the most vulnerable, actually the most vulnerable, and they are the one who bear the brunt of conflicts. After all, women stay in the houses, they become widows because of conflicts, and widow and women have to take care of wounded and maimed victims, and women have to go very far away to gather water during conflicts. Women have to find means to take care of their families during times of conflict. Now, we know that these women come from the most vulnerable of citizens. Now, what about the work of the Permanent Forum? The Permanent Forum has a clear mandate in six areas, environment, health, culture, development, human rights. The Permanent Forum always was focused to realizing its mandates. And the Permanent Forum is focusing on this theme, conflict, peace and resolution. Because a country or region that is in conflict to not, cannot hope for peace. Now, women are the most vulnerable, the biggest sufferers of conflict, but they're also the biggest hope for peace. Thus, access to peace is recognized as a fundamental right in the majority of countries where indigenous people live. These countries have made 
numerous legal and judicial reforms, they have, well, at least theoretically, jurisdictions or courts that do take account the needs of all their citizens. To this end, legal mechanisms and instruments do take into account international conventions, such as the Resolution 1325, which, is, which focuses on women, but also the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. There's also the, con the Convenant on Civil Rights and Political Rights. There's the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination. And other instruments were set up in these affected countries. But these reforms are meant to ease access to sustainable and effective access, especially for indigenous women. But this access remains insufficient and sometimes even inexistent for some social classes, particularly the most vulnerable indigenous women. It is essential for all states, international organizations, NGOs, to remove these obstacles and to adapt existing measures to address this predicament. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, and afterwards we can have a Q&A. We can also talk about what's, what's happening with factors limiting access to justice for Indigenous women, and we can also talk about solutions to provide better access. Thank you. Rosalina Tuyuk. Firstly, I would like to say that women who survive genocide, armed conflicts, in general, we are women that love peace and that also contribute towards the resolution of armed conflicts in the world. In a specific case of Guatemala, after the genocide, around 60,000 women who were sexually raped survived. Also, around 60 to 70,000 widows because their husbands were massacred and disappeared. Within this frame, women, us women, were looking for our loved ones, those who were buried in clandestine cemeteries. Most of us undergo a psychosocial situation, which is very difficult for our individual, familial, and societal livelihood. Most of the time, women are either waiting for death, and many are trying to recover life and a future. Hence, many of us work on mental health to enable us women to be the main actors in keeping peace and access to justice because we believe that torture, force, force uh, uh, and, and, and sexual abuse against women, girls, uh, pregnant women should not ever again happen. Therefore, we have knocked on justice's doors so that there will be investigation, indictment against of those that have perpetrated those cruel violations of human rights, sexual rape, and also the disappearance of children throughout armed conflict. We believe that it is also very important to highlight that all these violations 
and also that to understand peace, you can just understand a ceasefire, but that you must permanently work on social peace, on community peace, and peace across society. We have highlighted that before, during, and after war, the rights of indigenous women continue to be violated. In the past, discrimination was severe, and that is why the massacres resulted from that state institutionalized discrimination. And nowadays, through mining companies, through hydropower companies, and also through mega projects that are principally responsible in certain regions for the contamination of rivers, contamination of uh, water, but what's worse is that the majority of this, this, of this destruction of sacred places uh, on the hills or by the river, these are the new consequences of death. Many children, elderly, women, live with diseases that we had never seen in our history. This is why it is very important that the, that when the role that women play in conflict and after conflict continues to be a very significant role because we women are promoting culture of peace and not culture of war. Because it isn't just the topic of militarization that affects us, but we're also affected by that economic development vision, which does not take into account the respect for life, the respect for Mother Earth, and the respect for culture. Many of our cultural rights that were violated during war are currently being violated three times more than during armed conflict. That is the reason why the women who survived genocide in Guatemala are creating this national and international awareness that now we must look into the environmental issues as well, without which there will not be life for human beings, animals, or for the hills which are the lungs through which we breathe our oxygen and that are also the lungs for our lands to again recover life because this was also violated during war. Thank you very much. Corpus. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th um, as a special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, I have had the opportunity to visit uh, communities where conflicts, long-standing conflicts have been happening. But I also come from the Philippines where there has been a 50 years insurgency uh, by the Communist Party of the Philippines. So I, I myself uh, witness the, the situation of, uh, of uh, violence against women in situations of conflict. Uh, as uh, mentioned by my colleagues, uh, we indigenous women suffer disproportionately from the conflicts that are happening in their communities uh, for several reasons. Uh, uh, usually, uh, the military will use women as the, the instruments to quell any insurgency or resistance to the efforts of uh, of the state to uh, to control and to fight against the 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 insurgency, uh, the indigenous uh, peoples are usually accused of supporting the insurgents, which is not surprising because these communities have been uh, uh, neglected totally by the state. And then when there are insurgents who come to the communities uh, and they provide some of the basic social services that they need or address the issues of injustice against a landlord who has been despotic, then they, they sympathize and they align themselves with this, uh, with this insurgency. 
insurgents but that's not that's really because of the the need to address the more the pressing issues that they face but in the process they are accused as supporters of the insurgents and that is when they suffer the most rape has been uh, used as a common instrument to weaken the resistance of communities and uh, when the conflicts happen, the women are the ones who, who will stay in the community. In, in several communities I've been to, the, there are almost no men left. It's the women and children who are there. I remember when I went to Chiapas after the, in, the, the uprising in 1994, uh, when we went to the villages, there were just women and children left in the community. And that is, uh, and therefore, when the military comes to do the operations, the women are the ones who suffer the brunt of the ire of the military. Uh, I also have been to uh, Guatemala and I witnessed, I, was, I went to the trial of the Sepor Sarco widows. These are Maya women who have been raped by the military. The, their husbands were killed first, they were raped by the military and then they were made sexual slaves and they filed a case against the military in 19... And, you know, this happened in 1982. It was only this year that finally the trial happened and the two military men were indicted, which for me is a very good uh, victory because at least it really has proven that the military has been involved in, in that uh, horrid situation. And, and then I went to Colombia where I spoke with the indigenous peoples uh, regarding the ongoing peace agreements. And in that meeting, I, I talked with the Office of the High Commissioner in Human Rights, and they told me that in 2015 alone, there were eight indigenous leaders killed and 78 indigenous leaders, 11 of whom are women, women who were victims of, uh, of attacks. And during that same period, uh, they were threatened by the majority, by the paramilitary criminal gangs, uh, and they are threatened because they were referred to as participating in indigenous uh, mobilization. And they are leaders of the, ins uh, they are supporting the insurgency and therefore they are also terrorists. Uh, so, so the indigenous women are telling me that uh, when the peace agreements are going to be agreed upon, uh, of which indigenous peoples are out of the scene, uh, they really fear the, co the consequence on them. And one of the consequences that they, they fear is that the demobilized guerrillas are going to be brought into their communities again. And they feel that if these demobilized guerrillas will be brought there, there will be more violence against them. Against them. Their rights to their lands will be violated. And a conflict again will ensue because many of these uh, guerrillas also have been involved in killing some of their uh, people. So this is the picture of conflicts, uh, militarization, and uh, and the rights of indigenous women. And I certainly hope that in the peace agreements that are being developed, there should really be sections uh, dedicated to addressing the concerns of indigenous peoples in general, but indigenous women and the children in particular. Thank you. Thank you. The speakers will take some questions now. Yes. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Waldo from Prensa Latina. Just one question. What do you expect from this uh, 15th session of, uh, of, the, of the forum in terms of commitment, documents, or uh, specific action? Thank you very much. Thank you. With regard to this uh, theme and the discussion we're holding, specifically um, access to justice for indigenous women, as indigenous peoples, but also as a member of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, as my colleague highlighted the special rapporteur, Victoria Tolly. With regard to peace processes, we should have a clause that highlights the role of indigenous peoples and indigenous women. Because after having a look at uh, the negative consequences on conflict on indigenous women, it is important that indigenous women participate in peace processes, 
to make sure that these peace agreements are sustainable, but also to build the capabilities of Indigenous women. So we do have expectations. We do hope to have to make a recommendations to make to member states and the UN so that we can reference in peace processes a clause referring to the role of women, indigenous women. And the issues uh, uh, in relation to how conflicts and peace agreements are impacting on indigenous women should be, should be made more visible. And uh, I am aware that, you know, for instance, the UN Security Council is going to be involved in the peace agreements in, in, uh, in Colombia for the demobilization of the armed groups. And there are various UN agencies that are going to be involved as well, the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights for that matter. Usually the UNDP comes and talks about development, uh, post-conflict uh, development. And I certainly would uh, <clears throat> expect that the permanent forum will come up with recommendations for those uh, uh, bodies of the UN as well as the agencies to make sure <clears throat> that uh, indigenous women's issues uh, will, be will be dealt with, will be part of the agenda, you know, and also that indigenous uh, women's issues related to access to justice will also be dealt with. Uh, also those who have been displaced, internally displaced by the com from the communities because of the conflicts, that uh, measures be taken by the bodies like the, the uh, refugees, uh, body to, to really deal with these uh, uh, issues of indigenous women. How will they get back their lands? How will they go and live peacefully in their lands and develop these lands to be uh, to, to serve their peoples? And how will the, uh, the issues of access, how will there be trials against those who are uh, who have caused the rapes, who have done the rapes or done the violence against women that can be uh, that can be undertaken? Will there be a truth and re reconciliation committee for uh, councils where the, the issues of indigenous women women can be raised? and the solutions to what the indigenous women face will also be addressed. Uh, there is a lot of things that I'd like to see from the permanent forum, but this is just the beginning. It has never been an issue that was addressed by the forum. I have been, it, it's not easy to get the states to support this issue, but I think that now it's out there, and so there should be much more recommendations to really deal with these issues. Yes, Mr. Yu. I believe that it is very important that the mechanisms that safeguard the rights of uh, indigenous peoples and women should make more recommendations that are more have more depth in nature so that the United Nations may have a reaction, especially when the states are not abiding by their responsibilities. For example, in Guatemala's case, within the 15 years of Resolution 1325, there isn't an action plan. We, women, the ones that were victimized, were the ones that made a proposal to the state of Guatemala for them to adopt that plan of action over Resolution 1325, but there is no answer. I also believe that it is highly important in the light of cultural rights violations which happen in conflict, which happen in the midst of foreign investments, that there are so many violations of cultural rights. Therefore, we, we hear the uh, special rapporteur in whom we trust and respect greatly, but we believe that it is very important that a special or specific rapporteur be assigned for the cultural rights, about the cultural rights of the indigenous peoples. I also believe that it is very important that the, that the UN Security Council be able to 
review the actions of the states in terms of the commitments that they have accepted in, the, in terms of peace and security. Many states are part of the Security Council, but they tend to forget about the, their responsibility within their countries to guarantee peace and security. So I believe that we look forward to a lot, but the fact that the current mechanisms of the permanent forum, the rapporteurs and the experts should have action and unity to demand from the UN's General Assembly a lot more action where states can be can be reprimanded when individual and collective rights of the indigenous peoples are violated, where it is mostly women, girls, and teenagers who carry the load of the consequences of the state's action. Thank you. Uh, Mauricio Guerrero, Mexican News Agency. So a follow-up question. Are you expecting that the outcome, outcome, outcome document includes specific recommendations on the case of Berta Cáceres in Honduras and on the case of the Ayotzinapa students in Mexico, uh, given the symbolical importance of, this, of these two cases? Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I would hope so. <coughs> I... Uh, in my presentation yesterday, I mentioned about the case of uh, Berta Cáceres because I personally met her and she was the one who organized my visit to her community uh, last November. And, and so it personally, it affects me as well. So I would certainly hope so that they will make that, uh, that recommendation. But also the, the, the 43 students who were murdered because they spoke out, the father of the one of these students who disappeared spoke up very strongly yesterday, asking that support should be given for them to be able to find their children because it has been 19 months already and nothing has happened yet. So, so I would urge the members of the permanent forum to to say something about that because these are iconic cases of what happens to indigenous uh, peoples during uh, situations of conflict and it's but right that uh, such, uh, such situations be stopped because the impunity that continues to happen in many states which results in the deaths or disappearances of indigenous peoples and the rape and sexual assaults against indigenous women have to be stopped and um, action consolidated con and concerted action from different bodies within the UN should really be put in place so that this kind of uh, situation will not continue to prevail in many countries. Yes, Mr. Yuk. Senora. I also believe it very important to take Bertha Cáceres' murder as an example of what is currently happening in many countries to the defenders of the rights of the indigenous peoples. It is true that many of us are advocates of human rights, but we also advocate for collective rights. And therefore, in many of our countries, not only are there armed murders, but also in the case of Guatemala, there are instances where leaders die supposedly in traffic and accidents, but when there is an examination of their bodies, you see signs of torture, violence. I am able to say in the case of two brothers of mine who were temporarily kidnapped and tortured, and all official reports were indicating that these were traffic accidents. In the case of these two brothers, in 2013 and 2014, which is when they died, there isn't the adequate 
judicial process because medical and police reports indicate that they didn't involve violence. And that is why there are daily examples of cases like this in Guatemala. Sometimes it doesn't happen to us, but it happens to our family members, to colleagues who, whose names have not made it to the media. And that is why it is my hope that at minimum what the forum must do is to highlight these violations of the rights to life, cultural rights, which are constantly repeating in our countries where there are projects of extraction, where there are also projects such as the African Palm and like many other projects. Uh, je vais just to respond to your question. Now, we do recognize that there are heinous, egregious violations of human rights of indigenous peoples. We cannot express ourselves when we try to uphold the rights of indigenous peoples. Oftentimes, we are being challenged. Sometimes we have to protect one's life or speak up but face death or torture. So we are faced with a terrible dilemma, a dilemma that should not be present in the 21st century because after all we're talking about human rights, we're talking about free societies after all. And that it is quite clear that within Permanent, the Permanent Forum, as experts, we were greatly affected by the 43 students that disappeared in Mexico. We also talked about making a recommendation with respect to the 43 students, but you have to recognize that the experts have to produce a recommendation by consensus. To date, we there is no consensus. There is no consensus vis-à-vis -vis this recommendation. But we know that one of the father of the student, the, his presentation, highlighted the fact that we do need to take steps. We also saw the murder of Ms. Castle. This was a clarion call for us. Unfortunately, we hear this day in and day out as human rights defenders. We are being threatened very recently when activist in Burundi was threatened. And this is just ongoing in many countries. As a permanent forum, We will be having intense discussions in order to draw favorable lessons. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, everything that you're saying is very depressing and very true. Um, what I'm interested in is do you have any examples of anything improving or any examples of where something has been done that has made a change to this situation? Because what I see is a lot of desire to put something in a peace treaty, but peace treaties aren't often respected. And to put um, the UN in, but also the UN is often not respected, especially in conflict zones and especially in areas where there are indigenous people. Are there any examples you've seen that have changed the situation and things that could work that could be built upon? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, yes, we have uh, 
we, we have do we have examples uh, for instance uh, in Colombia I have seen a uh, community in Santa Marta de Nevadas where the communities just uh, the traditional authorities decided that they don't they are not going to take it anymore the guerrillas should get out of their communities and then the army should get out of their communities and to us, and for many years they were able to maintain the peace in their communities because they asserted their right to be the ones who have control over their territories the same case in my country in the Philippines I come from the Cordillera region it used to be a hotbed of insurgency as well and my in, in my in my town they, the people said the people got together and they said we cannot have the military putting a post here because they are going to be subjected to be by attacks from the new people's army we cannot also have the new people's army being here because the military will use that as a reason to come and, at, and attack all of us so they decided we will create our uh, communities to be peace, peace zones there will be no more armed groups in that community and we will protect ourselves so I, there are many examples it's just not uh, talked about very much but I think that uh, you know in, in a situation like now where you have uh, many peace agreements happening uh, I uh, and I hope that the, the ones who are coming up with the peace agreements will look into that and strengthen and, ex, and replicate that kind of uh, action. I think in the end, it's really how do you how do the the parties to peace agreements respect the right to self determination of indigenous peoples, the right to be able to keep their community secure and peaceful, and the right to be able to pursue their economic, social, and cultural development freely. That's really that crux, the foundation of the kind of peace that many indigenous peoples are looking for. Mr. Yuk? In Guatemala, we also see as a positive contribution on the part of us, the victims, even though the Commission for Historical uh, Clearance uh, recommends that the state bring forth social and cultural works. It is us, the victims, who have uh, raised statues in honor of uh, the victims in places where great massacres took place we also believe that another contribution towards life is that we are not waiting for the state to come to, to resolve our psychosocial issues from our own Mayan cosmovision. We ourselves have support health towards the psychosocial health of women. And this is why we women no longer feel as victims. We feel that we are actors, main actors of peace and social change. Another contribution in the recent 15 years is that we women have not just stopped at reporting the violations, but also, it, but also we have gone forward to propose laws, laws against racial discrimination, laws for the creation of reparation programs, programs for the defense of indigenous women. Even though the budget is not there, but regardless, this is an important step. What is also important is that we women have knocked on the doors of courts of justice because since the 80s, we reported genocide and sexual rape, and there was always a denial of such violations. But in 1997, the first trial was the first trial of rapists of women in the Quiche region took place because of a complaint that was filed by 32 Quiche women. There's also the case of the Ishiles women on complaints for genocide and rapes against chiefs of state 
and high-level military representatives. And as the special rapporteur mentioned, is the case of Sepor Sarko women because of sexual rape and also for domestic slavery, which happened throughout the country. But I believe that, uh, that the significant contribution by these women is an important step. We don't just raise complaints, but we have led important fights. Widows proposed a law against militarization, and such law is now in effect. And it allows youth not just to serve their country through military service, but also through social service. Um, Let me just respond to your question. Of course, we do see examples, positive examples. Now, there's one case I will talk about. It's not directly related to indigenous peoples, but still we can use it as an example. The Truth and Reconciliation for West uh, Africa. There's also a more current or recent case affecting indigenous people, which is the Peace and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. In conflict resolutions, there was a follow-up. There was a real, a real commission that was set up, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. This type of commission could prevent future conflict, conflict that is happening in my country, in Mali. But the, the biggest problem is that there's no real Truth and Reconciliation Commission in my country or other countries. So we do have to set up these types of commissions so that these people, these victims, be recognized by the violence they faced. But they also have to make sure that these people have access to justice because without access to justice, there's no social cohesion. So there must be a real will towards peace because we, there's a lot of examples, but there has to be a will to implement these measures, and these measures are lacking. Sure, thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access, thanks for the briefing. Uh, I guess I'll, if I have only one, I was going to ask about Guatemala, but I'll ask about Mali. How do you think the, the UN peacekeeping force that's there and the French force that went in to fight terrorism, how are they on, on indigenous issues and on women's issues? And also, how is the peace process? In, Oh, actually, uh, the, the only other thing I wanted to know is if you can say anything more about the Burundi complaint that you mentioned. Anything more, does it happen inside the country, among people that fled the country? It's, it's a country that I covered, so if you can, anything that you can say. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start with Burundi, because it will be more brief. Now, the Burundi complaint uh, was uh, highlighted. I'm not sure if the rapporteur received a copy of this uh, complaint that was highlighted by a human rights activist. I will not mention his name because he wants to remain incognito. So we received a complaint in February. He received, he was threatened with death. That's the case in Burundi. Concerning the UN mission in Mali and the French mission in my country, what's the impact on indigenous peoples? Well, in Mali, we're not recognized as indigenous peoples. We're not, we're not recognized as indigenous peoples. We are the Tuaregs. We are about 10 tribes or ethnic groups in Mali. We're not recognized as indigenous peoples, even though there is a lot of evidence that show that we are indigenous peoples. There are scriptures on uh, rocks in the Sahara that show that we've been there for since time immemorial. So there is a peace agreement being set up 
The international community is very proud of this peace agreement in Mali. This has been uh, ongoing for a year. This peace agreement has been signed a year ago. But personally, concerning this peace agreement, I think there's a lack of a real participation of the Tuareg population. Because how could you talk about uh, a peace agreement where one-fifth of the population is not even part of that peace agreement? One-fifth of the population is outside of the country. They're displaced, they're refugees, despite the peace agreement between Mauritania, Mali, Algeria, and Burkina Faso. So a lot of peoples are displaced, they're in France, they're in the States, they're in Canada. So very briefly, this is what I have to say on the situation in Mali. I can tell you more afterwards, but because we don't have too much time, I'm going to stop here. Thanks very much.